Hey, what's going on, guys? And welcome to another episode of Simple Man's Comics and Friends. This is our flagship podcast. It's the one thing that we definitely have on audio version, but as always, we have the video version as well. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, my partner in crime. The two of us make up Simple Man's Comics, but we also have our friends with us, and the first one with us tonight is... Tony Fix, who you might also know as Blue Green Artifacts. What's going on, Tony? How's it going, everybody? Good to see you Monday. Get ready to go here. Right. With us also, another guy. We're naming this another Patreon edition because both these panelists are Patreon members who help support the channel. We can't thank them enough. But we also have another YouTuber slash Instagrammer, and we are talking about Adam S. because I'm not going to mess up his last name, <laughs> but he's also a fellow Marine as well. So, Tufa Hoonan, Devil Dog, what's going on, Adam? Hey, Jack. Hey, Brian. How's it going tonight? We'll have to uh, be here. Really glad that you guys invited me on the show. Yes, we got a bunch of great topics for us tonight. We're going to put them up on the screen right now. But before we get into that, we talk to our guest. We got to find out what's going on with Jack. What are you doing, bud? Oh, man, Brian, I'm excited to be here because, you know, the title of this show is Simpleman's Comics and Friends. Um, and we've had some great guests, but this week we legitimately have two of our friends in uh, Tony and my man Adam. Although right now, Tony's name kind of sounds like he might be a mafia hitman and Adam kind of looks like one. So we got to <laughs> watch out with these guys. But, you know, I think this is going to be a great episode. Yeah, I'm happy to have these panelists. These are great. These are two huge supporters of our channel, but we talk to them all the time, especially in that private Discord. Always bring great topics, so we had to bring them on this podcast. And we're going to get into our topics on the podcast starting right now, with the first one being we've seen an increase in popularity in Star Wars comics and speculation recently, especially with Sabine Wren. We saw it with Ahsoka, but we keep hearing Star Wars buzz, and we're filming this on May the 4th, no doubt. But either way, Question is, do you see any other Star Wars characters from the comics that were kind of under the radar that you might see another speculation buzz coming up? Tony, we'll start with you. Do you have any favorite characters you're looking at? You know, I, I think uh, one that's destined to hit the screen at some point in time, and maybe even in a full trilogy of, of feature films, is Darth Revan. Um, I think there's so much cult following behind him. A lot of people actually put him above Darth Vader in terms of Star Wars villains. Um, the, the world is already built between the games and, and various comics. Uh, it, there's so many, you know, there's, there's a, over a decade of, of Star Wars comics out there between uh, the stuff at Marvel, the stuff at uh, even IDW, Star Wars Adventures, the old Dark Horse stuff. There's so many characters. Um, but I think Darth Revan is a safe bet. Yeah, I agree. There's been some buzz on it, but I still think it's flying under the radar. So I think that's an awesome pick as well. But Adam, what about you? I, I noticed I just bought a 9-8 Star Wars Rise of Kylo Ren off you. So <laughs> that's one book I've talked about recently. So I was happy to get that from you. But either way, are there any characters you're looking at as well? Uh, so you guys know my obvious pick probably would have been Darth Revan. Um, knowing me, you know, I named my son Revan. So he's uh, one of my favorite characters. I love anything from the Knights of the Old Republic. Um, and I really think that the Star Wars fan base has shown um, Disney and everybody else that they're kind of done with the Skywalker whole saga um, feel for now. And they're really moving towards those lesser known characters or even new characters, the Mandalorian, Baby Yoda. Yeah, because really just today they announced, um, I'm not going to kill his name, Taiki, you know, uh, well, the director yeah. of Thor, he's yeah. going to direct a new Star Wars movie. Yeah, and so I really I, I I'm going with the the Sith Lord theme as well. Um, go, but going back, I really think people are going to be interested once they, especially if they start going down that Darth Revan road. You have guys like Darth Bane, you got Mark Aragnos, Frieda Nand. I mean, you have the whole um, Sith history, which is super super rich. They could do whatever they wanted. I think um, a long time ago when Lucas, or no, it was actually Disney, right, who decanonized everything. Uh, I really think that opened up a lot of possibilities for them to do whatever they wanted. And then they have a wealth of things to pull from. Knights of the Old Republic set it up. Star Wars, the Old Republic, the online version set it up. You have a ton of stuff even going back to like Darth Vader's uh, Apprentice and all those things. So I think if any, any of those Sith Lords, especially those older ones, uh, many characters from Knights of the Old Republic, uh, I, I think are a safe bet. I think with Star Wars speculation not being um, 
really comfortable for a lot of people, you can take advantage of those really low prices right now. And you see, as soon as, as, soon as anybody's mentioned, those things spike 50, 60, $70 plus for a raw copy. Um, and, they're, and they're for sale for usually that 20 to $30 range to begin with. So now is definitely the time to jump on board. Let me ask you also, because we've heard this name and we've seen this comic and people are aware of these books and they still pick them up. But what do you think of the character Thrawn? Thrawn, um, I, it's, just, it's just so hard to say specifically with anybody right now where they're going to yeah. go with it. I really feel like, I feel like this is kind of must, what it almost felt like when they were starting to build that Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know what I mean? You, you really had no, I mean, you kind of had an idea of the direction, but it was all up in the air. Any, any pick could have been a good pick, but right now, before everything starts going, I would jump on anything you can. To even include stuff with uh, Kylo Ren. I really feel like Kylo Ren, um, I enjoyed his character. I think it'd be cool to see even a mini series or something else come out of it to, to see those kind of in-between moments between the trilogies or the, that later trilogy, you know, so. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going anything Knights of the Old Republic related, um, especially Sith Lords, I think are a safe bet right now. Jack. Yeah, I got totally piggyback. I think these guys are right on the Sith Lords, whether we're talking Darth Raven or, um, uh, you know, Cade Bane or Darth Nihilus, um, who I think is another one um, who is starting to get people's attention, but I, I think it's a solid bet. Now, there's some other obvious ones of some characters we've talked about. Um, characters like uh, Dr. Alpha, who I think is getting a lot of attention already. It seems to be bound to hit Disney Plus. And no matter how much attention she's gotten already, it hasn't hit the potential that the character overall has. Um, I think that Admiral Thrawn is a good one. Rose Tico is another interesting one who we previously saw. But um, her first appearance is in that IDW series that Tony mentioned. So you're talking about a kind of a tougher find. But the one I really like is actually my man, uh, and if I don't mention him, he's going to freak out, Mighty Mel V. Uh, his favorite pick, um, it, which is the, the Star Wars classic uh, from the Dark Horse, number seven, uh, which features the birth and first appearance of Boba Fett's daughter. Um, I think everybody is looking for uh, Boba Fett to, sh in some form, his presence in The Mandalorian. And while I think The Mandalorian has changed the game for comic uh star wars comics back that's still kind of the flagship brand so i really like things that really surround the mandalorian and the evidence of that has been the sabine wren stuff and the way that that's taken off um just on speculation surrounding that show now i still think the star wars volume one number 41 the first appearance of yoda who without yoda we still don't know baby yoda the whole kind of concept of that so i still look at star wars Four sperm. i still look at we don't know if that's a child we don't know if that's you know that's that's his child we don't know what the story behind that is if it's just another member of that race so either way i look at the first appearance of yoda and i say this is a, a classic key appearance that's really a five dollar book and is that's tragic in general though I don't think you can go wrong. I'm really bullish on Star Wars speculation in general. I think Adam's right. We're at the, the tip of the iceberg. These prices, the price, it doesn't matter any of these characters we're talking about, whether it's, it's Darth Raven or Admiral Thrawn or Dr. Alfred, these prices are not what Marvel and DC first appearance prices go for. Yeah. I like your pick. Well, not your pick. Your pick about Mel's pick about Boa Fett's daughter. I just don't like that book that you referenced because I think a hologram and a baby are bad picks. I've said it on here before. I hate baby spec. But they're like, oh, look back at that, whatever those Spider-Man books were where it was so such as a baby. Nope. I'm always about when the character starts to be who they're supposed to be. And for that reason alone with Mel's pick, I tend to like that Star Wars blood ties Boba Fett is dead. Number two better where it's got Boba Fett on on the I'm not gonna misname the animal, but so I picked up a couple copies of that after Mel talked about it on the show. But for me, the character that I like, and I've talked about briefly, um, I won't say it's good spec, but it's something that I like, especially with the popularity of that whole Jedi Fallen Order video game. A lot of people have been playing about, especially with today, with May the fourth, they got new content coming out. I say today, we recorded this the night before it airs, but I actually like that Trilla Sidori, that second sister Inquisitor, the main villain of that game. Um, cheap, super cheap right now, created by a comic book author and Charles Sewell and Giuseppe Camincoli. So you can find it, first appearance in that Darth Vader number 19, 
But Jedi Fallen Order Dark Temple, the one that that series that's based on that game, issue number five had a one in ten variant with her right there on the cover with her badass lightsaber and freaking full on Darth Vader Inquisitor looking costume. The only problem is in the game, she gets killed by Darth Vader. So I still love the character, and you never know what they might do with any of these spinoffs or I know Kathleen Kennedy says they don't have the material to create a bunch of movies, but they got everyone else knows just books, novels, everything. So you ever know about this character. And I picked these books up super cheap just because I love the character and I love that video game. We might be able to take advantage of a, a spike in that. I mean, what you see with even a lot of the one-off Marvel villains, if you if you get ahead of time, everybody jumps on that that train and, and you, you get spike if you're trying to turn something or flip something over like that. Especially when you got a badass female villain, right? You don't see yeah. it that too often. Captain Phasma, that's why I like Phasma. I think yeah, that she's a waste they, of a character. But if they go into her, if at yeah. some point yeah. they do something where they explain at all who she is or how she came to be, we don't know anything about her. Yeah. Um, if they go into her backstory, that uh, that Poe Dameron 2 could mm-hmm. be a sneaky, sneaky book. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see him do something with the uh, the Gray Jedi Order as well. The the Gray Jedi, I know that's a that's a pretty big fan favorite as well of of everybody who knows a bit more about the Star Wars universe. Um, that'd be really cool to see. You can go in a lot of different directions with that as well. I think there's a lot of characters that a lot of things that were done sloppily in the trilogy that they might try to revisit. And I, I like like Phasma, like Captain Phasma. I mean, because you got a lady in a giant shiny stormtrooper outfit, and you have no idea why, and then she just suddenly dies. You know, people want to know more, so. <laughs> And she Tony, sold merchandise. Yeah. Tony, sold you were going to say something also? I was just going to say, I think a couple things about Star Wars that, that are big. Uh, you know, we've had Mandalorian so far, and with the just insane success of that, I think in, a, in another year and a half, we're going to see a slate of Star Wars Disney Plus shows, this mm-hmm. like we've seen on, with Marvel. So there's going to be a lot, you know, regardless of what Kathleen Kennedy is saying, there's going to be a lot of stuff out there. And, you know, hopefully some of it is Old Republic and the, the the kind of thing that the longtime fans have been looking for but i do think a lot of what they're going to pull from in the beginning is from these uh younger age shows from clone, from wars. The cartoons, clone wars you know so there's a whole generation of kids who already grew up with this they know who ahsoka is so when mm-hmm. she's cast in mandalorian that's instant name recognition mm-hmm. so looking at clone wars looking at disney infinity look at all the characters who were in disney infinity uh, or even those Star Wars adventures. I think yeah. they're definitely going to want to stay young, you know, and and not just service the older fan base. Yeah, yeah I'll just have you know before we started recording this. I mean, Adam totally changed his pick because he told me he was going heavy on Jar Jar Binks. Oh, uh, you're not <laughs> okay. to tell people that, man. That's that's, that's our secret, you know. <laughs> you need a help with this comic book. <laughs> I said that in confidence, man. You can't be telling everybody. <laughs> Star Wars number eight, the first Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the I, still, I still think uh, picking up Ahsoka's um, first appearance, if you can afford it, I know it's like around a $250, $300 raw book, but I don't think that's seen nearly the, yeah. the limit it's going to. I think it's going to be like an ultimate Fallout 4, even like the uh, Edge of Spider-Verse 2 comic book. I, I think there's going to be a lot of room to grow. Uh, and especially with the limited runs they have in these these comic books, it's going to be one. If you can get it now, definitely get it now because it's going to keep going up. Yeah, I think the trifecta right now would be Ahsoka, Sabine Wren, and, of course, Afra. Those those three mm-hmm. for books are definitely ones people are buying up. Yeah. But So a lot of Star Wars stuff we know is coming on Disney Plus with Mandalorian. But with Disney Plus, we also have HBO Max, which is getting ready to premiere later in this month. I think it starts May 27th. And we know there's a Green Lantern show, right? That's in the works. Mm-hmm. We know that J.J. Abrams has that Justice League Dark in development. With that being said, are there any other Warner Brothers DC-type properties that you would like to show, see show up in there as a show, movie, whatsoever, on this HBO Max streaming service since DC Universe kind of just crapped the bed for all intents and purposes? But, Tony, what about you? You know, I... The problem that I've had with the DCU has been uh, it, they haven't really strayed from the big guys, from the big guns. We've just seen Batman again and again. We've seen Superman again and again. It was good to see Wonder Woman on screen, and, and I'm glad that was a good movie. I'm glad they're making sequels. But, uh, it, you know, in kind of the same way that Marvel has brought up their B players and even C and D players and turned them into na- household names, 
DC has a huge, you know, rogues gallery of, of characters out there. So I'd kind of like to see him give projects to weird directors like Taika Waititi or whoever, uh, some weird showrunners and just run with, you know, plastic man, do metal men, do uh, booster gold. I, I'm not really a DC guy, but growing up for whatever reason, I just, I liked booster gold, the Dan Jurgens uh, origin stuff, maybe before he got with blue beetle. Um, the, the, so I'd like to see, him, you know, be kind of outside the box and they've done that with a lot of the TV. Um, Titans has been successful with swamp thing. The, you know, the, the one season that they came out with, but I guess I'd like to see them do that kind of thing. Be more creative. Don't, I don't want to, I don't want them to worry too much about crossing over and okay, we got to have these characters and then they're going to be in a team show. I think DC is better with uh, each character having their own little universe and, and just, uh, you know, lending to the creativity of, of whoever is writing or drawing it in the comics or whoever is directing it on, on film. What about you, Adam? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as, uh, as Tony. I've always been a, a Marvel guy. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the DC universe. Um, but I, you know, I enjoy probably the big character that I enjoy from like the, the big guys like he was talking about was Flash. Even the CW Flash show, I've really enjoyed that. Even with getting a few seasons deep, it's still been good. Um, but as far as, uh, a, a character, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd want to go with like a Constantine. I think Constantine would be really cool. I think they could especially on HBO, you can do a more adult oriented show. You know, you don't have to worry about it being family friendly. They could do a little bit more of like a horror thing, get that going on, have it be, you know, really uh, like intense, really delve deep into it. And especially with, I think a lot of places uh, or a lot of um, companies are seeing the, the value in these streaming services, especially with something like this pops up where movies are shut down and all these different things and people are at home streaming. Um, I think a lot more money is going to be put into these uh, these movies and series they make on all these streaming shows. So I think they could really do something really, really cool. I think Tony hit it on the head with, I think a big part of Marvel's success was that they didn't just go with the A-list team. Obviously, they built it around the Avengers to start with. But <clears throat> I mean, some of the movies I remember enjoying the most uh, was when Ant-Man came out, when Guardians of the Galaxy came out and I went with no expectations and it was just, they just did really, really well-made movies. They all tied in really well. Um, I think their their thought process once they had that success with Iron Man was they, they shot a little bit more long-term than DC did. I think because DC tends to struggle so much with their movies and their success, I think they're a little bit too short-term with their goals. And I think that kind of hurts them when they try to do these, these tie-ins. So I, I think what Tony's saying is a great thing is just give these characters their own go, give them a shot let people decide if that's somebody they want to invest in or not, if they're going to watch or not. And I really think if they do that, they'll be able to spend a little bit less money um, and kind of see where the popularity is at and then maybe give it a go again later on with the Justice League or be able to tie things in more. And I think DC might honestly just have a little bit more success right now with TV series in general than trying to get those big movies out to compete with Marvel. So I'm going to go with Constantine. I think Constantine would be cool. <laughs> Well, I think, Brian, we've got to look at it and say this is a tough question. So as far as where they're going to go, it, I think it ultimately depends on the success of the first couple. Um, the safest bets, and I know that we're talking more conjecture with, like, where do we think uh, property-wise they're going to go, but we also know that, like, people listen to us and then they make financial decisions sometimes off the things that we say. So I will say that as far as, like, investment-wise, I'm really only paying attention to the Green Lantern stuff as well as Justice League Dark, because that's that these properties are going to need to, to kill um, in order for this to go further. I think the success of Watchmen is why we're having this go the direction that it's going. Um, the thing about the DC Universe is it's, it's kind of been stop and start. Um, they've gone several different directions. Not everything has been as unsuccessful as even myself makes it out to be. Um, Aquaman was a successful movie. Shazam Wonder was Woman, great. Wonder Woman was a successful movie. Um, and The Joker was obviously an incredibly successful movie. Um, the problem is, is that you currently have a very segmented DC universe. So we have the CW Arrowverse television shows going on at, in one area. We're going to have these HBO Max shows going on in another area. 
And then we've got the movies, and the movies may even get split into two factions because you may have a set of one-off movies similar to the Joker, which is apparently what Warner would prefer to do right now. But you also have the stars of their other movies, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who's said to have a lot of influence within the DC universe, as well as Gail Gadot, who are sitting here going, wait a minute, I don't want to just do one-off movies. I want to do crossovers with Superman, with Batman, with whomever. They got the movies wrong. They messed up Batman versus Superman. They messed up Justice League. But I don't necessarily think you throw everything away right there. Um, And I would even go so far as to say, and this may sound crazy, but HBO could be our best opportunity at a Batman television show because a Affleck Batman HBO show, and and HBO is a company that Affleck has worked with in the past, um, could be the proper vehicle for Affleck to be Batman, but maybe not be at the same um, plateau where it's not stepping on what Robert Pattinson's doing. Going forward, if, if I'm going to sit here and just purely conjecture, I like what both Tony and Adam are saying. I think they're both right on. I think the key to this right now is to elevate characters, give you characters you're not familiar with. You guys both said you're not huge DC fans. I am a huge DC fan. I know Brian is as well. Um, there's a lot of characters who ha- we've seen the same ones over and over again. And you guys mentioned movies and TV, but we've also in the comics, it just it seems like the big crossover events tend to always focus on this same group of characters. And because of that, we're not exposed to all these great characters. I think Booster Gold is the prime perfect example. I know Tony mentioned Booster Gold. Booster Gold, you're talking about a character from the future, a character who's like egotistical, a character who's like most of us would be if we all of a sudden had superpowers because his whole attitude is like, how can I get my shine? How can I be popular? What are the benefits of being a superhero? And it's such a different look because he's almost Biff Tannen. He's been in the future. He knows future technologies. He knows what's going to be happening historically. And that gives him an advantage. And that advantage he uses to his own gain. And that kind of like duality of like an anti-hero character, I think could be very good. Yeah, I agree. And then also going back to what Adam said with about those one-offs for Marvel movies, the Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant-Man. The great thing about that is out of all the movies that we know with Avengers and all the ones that came before it, Guardians of the Galaxy is my favorite Marvel movie. But, and then what you said, also, Jack, I think Batfleck would be great. But another one also, we've heard Kevin Smith champion this. I think the question would be great. Kevin Smith wants to do the question, give him the opportunity on HBO Max. But another thing also, I like to think something differently that I think would be cool is what is one of HBO's all-time best tv shows right james gandolfini we got the sopranos what if they did a move a tv show series with carmine falcone and it basically set in gotham but he's that the villain's the protagonist someone you don't really know much about expand on the story but then have like you know touching all the tangible parts of gotham and the effects oh yeah the bertinelli versus falcone war yeah that brings in huntress that brings in yeah there's so many there's so many side characters that's a great idea and you have so much room to play with because you don't have a strict freaking you can (laughs) bring people in and bring them out and it kind of touches on the family people are attracted to that lord but basically you got yourself another sopranos type show but a whole different set piece for it and the sopranos is coming back the sopranos is another one coming back on hbo max with uh the what's it the saints of new jersey or whatever it is the prequel yeah you know i i I think too with uh the the gotham tv series i i enjoyed watching that and i think it was pretty cool to kind of see how jim gordon yeah he came to be commissioner gordon i really think a lot of people uh, took interest in, in those kind of prequel stories like you're talking about and would love to see how all these things became Gotham and, and how all these And you mean it's so much out. darker being on HBO. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. I, I enjoyed Gotham to watch Jim Gordon's kind of story. I yeah. also enjoyed uh, Pennywise on Epics, mm-hmm. although it was a little Britishy. It, it was enjoyable to kind of see uh, Alfred's um, kind of a or Pennyworth. I said Pennywise. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting so many comments <laughs> right right <laughs> Pe- yeah penny worth um but i think that there's a lot of in any comic universe there's a lot of those like side characters that you really never delve into their full story um and then these kind of shows can not only allow you to do it and c- 
get the connection with the comic book crowd, but also, which, which I think is important, is give the director and the writer some artistic leeway to, like, do their right. thing and, and create. Uh, and by using a character who there isn't years and years of backstory on, I think it gives them a bit more freedom. Right. Yeah. From, from myself, if you look in my comic boxes, I think the vast majority of my DC books are old Vertigo titles. I would love to see within, you know, oh, not yeah. superhero stuff, but within the HBO Max have like a, like a Vertigo imprint, a Twilight zone you know, miniseries or ongoing, whatever, but just total creative freedom, dark, creepy, uh, just, you know, totally off the wall but I, I would look that's that would be my favorite thing to watch on the or, or who knows will we see any of that joe hill black label yeah so but moving on the next one we're talking about we've talked about on this channel a couple times but it's great to have panelists on to talk about this as well we've talked about that boom studios that first look deal with netflix there's been some debates going on about what's being optioned what they think will be optioned Give, having that being said whether we should be excited about this point or which ones do you think are meaningful, how do you see Boom's Netflix deal working out? Are there favorite titles that you guys would like to see adapted or what are some sure bets that you think? Either way, let's touch the whole spectrum on this, whether it's you, the fan, wanting to see something or something you guys downright know, hey, I see this one becoming a Netflix show. And I'd like to talk even deeper than that, more than just Boom. Um, there's a talk in the community in general about options like should we get excited for option news anymore or is it redundant is we hear the term constantly in the community everything gets option so how do you guys feel about that and does that at all change your perception of this netflix news so for for me the the biggest thing i would i would say with when it comes to option news is i think people are a little burnt out from it not necessarily because of all the option news that's coming out, but because of their, their attitude and the way they view it. Um, honestly, what ends up happening is you get a notification, this has been optioned, comic spike, what happens, everybody scrambles to get them. So people are getting them starting off three, four, five dollars, and it's 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, so how, whatever the price ends up going up to. And then it kind of sits around for a while and sits and sits, prices kind of drop a little bit. You know, the whole spec cycle, you guys talk about it all the time. But I think that the biggest issue with this isn't necessarily Boom Studios or Netflix or anybody op optioning things, is it's us as the comic community. Because what we do is we get frustrated that now things aren't coming out as quick as we'd like. Maybe something we paid a little bit too much for because we were a little bit late, uh, late to jump in on it. Now is no longer option, so now we're losing out money. So now we're kind of jaded on the whole thing. Um, and I think when it comes to this option news is you should be excited about it, but if you're going to be excited about it, invest in it. Don't look at this like a penny stock that you're going to, you're going to get cheap and flip for a really high amount of money. Look for it like an investment. And if you, if you look at it that way, so let's say you, you, you buy a, a comic book for 15, $20 and it sits around and it drops back down to 10. Well, if you, you know, ride the ride and you, you wait and it does end up going through, well, now your, your investments turned over and you can make some money on that or you can just keep it it was a great you know whether you like the character the series whatever it is but if you just try to flip these comics every week or every time there's option news and you're trying to buy it for 30 40 50 dollars and then you're going to expect it to keep climbing and it doesn't climb that's not their fault that's your fault and then all you're doing is ruining the experience for yourself it was kind of like when everybody got wrapped up in the whole um uh venom run with uh with eddie brock and and all that and when when were we going to see um, I don't even know why I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, Eddie's son. Um, Dylan. Dylan. Oh my goodness. Yeah. D like I, I, I was speculating heavy on that. I was buying five, six issues every single time it was coming out. Um, every single time a, an issue would come out, I'd be disappointed because now nothing's coming to fruition with Dylan. They're trying to build the story, this, that, and the other. And what it ended up doing was it took away from my enjoyment of being able to enjoy the series as a whole, because I was so worried about trying to make that quick flip. Um, so I think if everybody kind of takes a step back, slows down a little bit, you'll be able to continue to buy comics, look into these characters, be excited about these shows without, as long as you're not getting wrapped up in the, the money part of it, where you're trying to just use this as a flipping opportunity. Because if you're trying to play the game like that, everybody, anybody investment wise is going to tell you the worst stocks to invest in are those penny stocks. The worst thing to try to do is to try to flip anything that you buy. The best thing to do is to buy it, hold it, 
see where that long-term investment goes. And I guarantee you take all that stress away, all that financial stress too, you're going to be able to enjoy the whole process a lot more. So. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I, I think uh, it's in the word option. It's not a sure thing. It, it's, it's a contract that yes, we may, we have the choice to, to make this or not. Um, and I, I think you got to realize that these companies that are optioning these properties, uh, you know, there's a couple uh, science fiction novels that, that I love that got optioned a few years ago and have, have just died. Red Rising by Pierce Brown and uh, Sleeping Giants by Sylvain Nouvelle. They would make great movies and great TV shows. And these, these, uh, the big production companies spend millions to option them and just let the option lapse. So I think we're going to see that a lot in the comics. Um, I, I do think there's a, if you follow it and, and see when there's an actual order taking place in terms of uh, TV shows, if episodes have been ordered, that's, that goes beyond the, you know, then it's not just an option. It's actually being created. It's being filmed. Um, in terms of spec though, I, I totally agree with you. I, you can't just, you know, watch the news and whatever, whatever issue is popping today, go buy three, you know, three copies for 15, 20 bucks and expect to make money on them. Um, that kind of news becomes, uh, if you want to hit the dollar bin or go to your half price books, you can run into some of these issues that, that, you know, people weren't valuing at all. If you can pick them up for one or two or three bucks, then yeah, you could flip it for 10, 15, 20 and make a little bit of money. Um, I think the best way to treat options is like you guys say, buy what you love. Like if there's a book that gets optioned that you really love, you, you know, that the characters or the story, or it's just so creative or so cinematic. If you think that, the chances are there are some movie execs who feel the same way as you do. You know, there's a reason why everybody's on the saga bandwagon. There's so many people who are passionate about it. So if you're passionate about something, there's a good chance that somebody else is passionate about the same thing. And then if it, if it does blow up and you've specced on it and, and you're kind of invested in it, uh, you know, it's a great feeling. It's like buying a penny stock and, and watching it, watching it blossom. Um, but yeah, you should definitely don't just go out and buy every single copy of everything that that gets optioned. You're just gonna have a you're gonna have a lot of long boxes full of nothing. So I'm glad we posed this question to you guys because I think what you guys said um, I don't disagree with, but I think it's very much the sentiment of like <clears throat> what you hear people talk about. Um, and it's not that you guys were are negative about options, but you guys both kind of have that fatigue a bit. And I think that there's some things to consider. First off, I love independent comics. So it's obviously it's an area that we follow and pay attention to a lot on the channel. Um, there's a couple of things that I think are key to this whole independent options and especially how it relates to the boom situation. Um, first off, people don't understand how to play the independent comics game. It's a different game from Marvel and DC. And when you try, and I'm, and I'm talking specifically to my re resellers, my flippers, my investors who watch, and they're the ones who are maybe the most vocal complainers. We hear this all the time. We talk about indie books, right, Brian? There's no money in independent books. They just go down. And it's because it's you're playing it wrong. If you waited for it to go down, that's your fault. Because there's a pattern that applies to independent comic books time and time out. A book is coming out for release, it gets hot, it shoots up in price. If you're holding the book, if you bought the book at cover price, your choice at that point is either to sell or to hold yet expect the price to drop. So if you're holding, you're holding saying, I'm okay with it coming back down to cover price from its current price of 10 to $15. Then you have to wait for the option news. When the option news happens, and, and the key collector alert goes out and 50,000 or 75,000 people then get FOMO panic and they're running out to buy. That's when the price drives up again. But if you wait more than three or four days to sell that book, guess what? That book is back down cold again because everybody's moved on to the next alert. And now you're waiting for casting news, a trailer or something else. And the point is, Adam's right. It's not a quick flip, but you've got to know when to jump out of that investment. And that's the key about indie comics. It's not a sit and ride forever. 
it, even if you did that with Walking Dead, you're literally watching your Walking Dead number one kind of lose value year by year. Um, so the key with independent comics, if you're going to sell them, is to know when to get out. Then the key with options is, if you're going to invest at the option point, do not buy when that alert goes out, ever. The only way time you do that is if you see it as soon as that alert goes out and you can clear out cover price copies from your favorite online honey hole. Other than that, you have to wait till that four or five day drop off happens. Now, once that happens, how do you decide what, whether an option is just an option or it's more than that? Well, first off, it depends on who's doing the option. So I have some people in the industry that were, Brian and I are friendly with some creators and they all view options differently. So Jason Latour has had my favorite comic book, Southern Bastards, optioned by FX for like six straight years. And he doesn't necessarily feel some pressure to hurry up and make that into a show. And they just keep re-optioning it. So he keeps allowing that option to be re-optioned. He's getting paid. He's not really worried about it. So without him being motivated to like push them to make that show, I don't, I don't necessarily know that that show is going to move. Yet FX, who's owned by Disney, keeps paying for it. Um, but in a situation like this, this is a corporate entity, Boom Studios, who is a co-creator on all of these books. It's going to affect their bottom line if these books actually get made into movies. They are going to do their corporate due diligence to make as much of this into Netflix features as possible, which is why this is a different deal. When you see the Russo brothers adapt something, you have to look at their track record. They've taken comic books like See You Dad, the Ani Press uh, graphic novel, which is now Extraction on Netflix, which I don't think many people, we talked about this before we went on air, I don't think many people even realize it's a comic book from 2014. But the Russo brothers, they have that track record. They've taken comics. They've turned them into shows. Um, it, you have to bet on somebody with that track record. The Sci-Fi Network, if they option your favorite independent comic, it's probably not going to be successful but they've turned them into shows consistently. Netflix needs the Boom IP. Uh, Boom is the third largest producer of comic book IP. Netflix desperately needs it if they're gonna fight HBO Max, if they're gonna fight the Peacock Network, if they're gonna fight Disney Plus. So I believe in the Boom stuff. I believe in all of those top five from our top 10 from Bone Parish, Once in the Future, Something's Killing the Children, Black Badge, Lumberjanes, Mouse Guard. I believe in all of those and I think you should too. Yeah. yeah, Jack, you know, something you said that I think is key, and that's knowing when to get out. Because uh, I think a lot of people want to spec or invest in independent books thinking that you're going to find that Walking Dead number one. You're going to find this book is going to be a thousand, ten thousand dollar book in 9.8 in six years. I just got to hold out. You know, they're going to do it. Um, those That's like trying to catch lightning in a bottle. I mean, for every for every book that you happen, you're going to buy 10,000 that, that do nothing. So knowing when to get out is key. And even with Netflix, I mean, we know the, the amount of money that Netflix is throwing at these properties, but we've seen now, we've seen some properties that once it's released on Netflix are not that good. Viewers was was a little disappointing. And even if it's good, you still only got three or four days. You only got three or right. four days. Yeah. Look at Lock and Key. Look at, uh, um, what was the other one? The, the Gerard Way book, uh, Umbrella Academy. Yeah, yep. Yeah. There's a window. And it might come back, you know, boys is, you know, the, the heat is still there. Umbrella Academy, if, they, if the second season keeps it up. Um, but best case scenario, it holds its value. Um, there may be one that just skyrockets, and you never know which one that's going to be. But um, if you are if you are doing this as investing, yeah, you definitely have to know when to sell. Yeah. You can't play baseball and then complain that the rules aren't the same as football. Well, I view option news completely different because I, I think, one, because I'm not really into the business of flipping and speculating. So I usually buy what I like. So usually when that option news comes around, I'm not chasing a book because I've already liked it that I already have copies of it. So if it goes like that and I want to get rid of a copy, I'm like, okay, I'll sell a copy, but I'm never, I never feel some sense of FOMO because I've never getting really hyped up in option news over some book that I've never really heard of, or I'm looking to flip and, and, and sell real quick. And then 
Adam kind of made me chuckle because he's like, man, I went hard on these Venom books. I bought five copies of each issues when there's speculators, viewers out there going, ha, five copies. I'm going 20 deep, 50 deep or even higher, which also leads to the downside of the option news because they go so high. They end up that option news flakes out, show doesn't get made. Or like you said, Jack, that independent run goes real quick. And now they're the ones that are voicing that opinion like, and these suck, these suck because they've got burned so many times and left hole in the bag of 50 copies of some comic that they shouldn't have bought in the first place. But right. option news, I think is great for books. I think it drives the hobby. I also think we've talked about it before where you kind of want to do a little research and don't just rely on an alert or, an, or some type of app. So you make sure you don't become one of the ones that get burned by it. But either way, Option news is great. It drives the comic hobby to a point. And everyone loves seeing that media that they're used to reading come to life on screen. So that, that it's always going to be some something there with hearing. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat everything I said with the fact, like, I'm excited to see what, what, what comes out artistically, creatively, series-wise, shows, movies, all that stuff. Um, with independent comics, I'll, <clears throat> I, I, I'm sure myself, just like a ton of other people, enjoy getting away from that typical superhero genre you know what i mean um you find a ton of creative writers a ton of creative artists i love the fact that when you're buying into a lot of these independent comics you're supporting those people directly um, there's so many people with so many good stories out there and everything and it's just there's so many people who are so underrated and deserve so much more and some of these titles should definitely be bigger than some of these marvel and dc titles and and all that so even though I don't typically go towards that that area anymore for the the spec and flip game, because uh, for me it's a little too time invested. Like like Jack said, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, jumping in, flipping within the next few days. Um, artistically, creatively, I'm super excited to see what they got. So it's uh, I'm really looking forward to it, um, and I'm sure a bunch of other people are too. So I guess we'll I guess we'll see uh, what comes to be from some of these titles. And it's, it's something fun to see when you see something that's creator owned, that's got the smaller scale uh, readership, right? And it gets option and that becomes on screen. And then you've been a fan of it from the beginning and see it all come to life versus the big two stuff gets option. And you're kind of like, well, everyone knows who the character is. It's great to see, but there's also me. I like seeing the smaller creator owned stuff come yeah. to life and, and come up on screen. It just, adds to that fuel for liking the story. To be well, and the beauty is if Dark Knight's Metal does end up on HBO Max, James Tinian, who wrote much of it, isn't going to get paid a dollar for it. Yet, when eventually Something's Killing the Children ends up on Netflix, mm -hmm. James Tinian stands to make a lot of money yeah. for the popularity of Erica Slaughter. Um, and, you know, the same with Karen Gillian with uh, Once in Future. Um, you know, uh, the same with David Peterson and Mouse Guard and Matt Kent with Black Badge and Cullen Bunn with Bone Parish. Talk about some big names. So that's another thing I don't think people really realize is that Boom has the opportunity to produce these these properties with Netflix that aren't coming from these nobody indie people yeah. that, you know, people think that these are coming from some heavyweights in the comics industry. Yeah. And, and not to mention how many reflected in the work. Not to mention how many other doors Boo might might be opening for some of those other indie publishers like yes. TKO and, and some of those other ones that you hear about that have those great stories of those creative teams. Yeah. Yep. It, uh, a successful deal with Netflix is good for the industry. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I think specifically with Boom, uh, and you can even see it just this last week, that what is that show, Never Have I Ever? It's just a giant, been a, been a big hit. That's teen girl content i mean it's 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 quality content it's well cast and well written but that's i think that was i think a big uh draw for netflix for boom because they have all those box titles and i know we've talked about lumberjanes for years and and stuff like that giant days um but that's a that's a segment of the market that is not catered to very much and i i think there's there's some people hungry for those kind of stories out there. There's a lot of dark vampire movies out there already. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of monster hunter movies. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think this is something that's kind of fresh and new uh, that, that Boom has to offer, definitely. And to going along with what Brian said, with some of these smaller titles get, becoming more popular, um, I'm sure a bunch of people are going to be ready and waiting to be 
all you guys are posers, man. I remember I was reading this before it was ever optioned. I, I was there before Boom had this Netflix deal, man, so I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you're already, <laughs> let me tell you something. You're already hearing that with Boom. Yeah. So Brian and I have been talking Boom for a year. We've been sitting here noticing, like, we saw this coming. And when we started talking about it, we caught a lot of flack from people. We heard everything from your Boom homers to, you know, oh, it's, it's you guys have a relationship with them. Um, when in reality, it was just, it was our pick of who was doing it right and who we felt like was going to win in the next year to two years. And now after the Netflix deal, you're already starting to see some of those same critical people turn around and be like, oh man, I've loved Boom Studios, but not like last year, Boom Studios. Like I liked them way back, you know, back in 2014, 2015, you start seeing a lot of that. <laughs> Moving on to the last topic for this show. We're going to talk about CBCS for a minute. Big news came out this week. They just launched the census for CBCS. This is something that a lot of fans have been asking for. It's been a couple of years now. People have been waiting for it. And it's finally come out. How do you think this affects CBCS going forward? And how do you think it'll have an effect on the market as well? To be honest, I didn't, until this news came out, I didn't realize they didn't even have a census. So I guess I, in, in my mind, it's kind of a given if it's something that, that a company like that should offer. Um, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's definitely a marketing tool. It's, I look up census information if I'm considering, you know, purchasing a book, investing in a book, or even getting something graded, what, um, you know, what, what is worth grading for a certain comic book? If it's a 9.4, 9.6, is it worth it? Or should it only be a 9.8? Uh, so it's good to see that CBCS is, I guess, catching up in that arena. Um, I think they're kind of on equal footing in other parts of it, but uh, I, I think it's something that should have been offered. So I'm glad they do. Yeah, I, I definitely think um, any sort of competition between CBCS, uh, CGC, and right now those are, really the two obviously the two big ones um pgx even the this new egs service that's come out any sort of competition in the industry is good for everyone um not only is it going to give us better prices better products better services um also too it's going to help like tony said be, help you to be able to make better financial decisions as far as how much you want to invest in a book should you jump is it really worth that extra money to go from that nine two to that nine four should i only get in the nine eight um it's going to be interesting to see how this census release is going to affect the prices of just comics in general because a lot of people with only having the one cgc census you know are going off well x amount of this x amount of that and now it's going to be flooded with well maybe there's one and a half times double triple quadruple in that grade i mean i i can only speculate as far as how how many are going to be uh how much that's going to increase for each book each grade obviously that's going to be specific to each uh each and every one but Something like this is definitely good for us as a community because it's just going to give us uh, more accurate information, better competition between the companies. And I mean, CBCS has really been lately really trying to step up their game as far as what they can offer, what they're doing, turnaround times, all that. Um, their grading uh, has definitely been has definitely been good. So I think uh, this pressure coming from CBCS is going to only translate to better product and service from CGC, and they're going to have to adapt. Um, they're going to have to push the envelope in some way that's going to make CBCS then have to turn around and do the same thing. And as, as the years go on, this is, this is what we want as a community. We want that competition. You don't ever want it to just be CGC is the gold standard and that's it. And that's all we got. That's bad for us. That's bad. You know what I mean? Cause that for a whole slew of reasons, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this does. I think it's only going to help CBCS um, in general, the comic community in general. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see over the next few months kind of how this affects everything. I, th I think Steve Borak from uh, uh, CBCS is the man because I think he handled this perfectly. First off, he caught a lot of flack early on about not having the census, but he really stayed steadfast and true to the reasons why the census wasn't out there. And I think not a lot of people understood that. Uh, people would complain about a lack of a census as if it was, say, an oversight on CBCS's part, when in reality, it was done to protect the values of all of the comics that we love. It, you know, I, I don't want to get too, like, mathematician on you, but we're talking about a matter of sample size. Yeah, so if you have a big enough canvas to create 
one. Right. If your sample size is too small, if, if they would have started and then immediately had a census upon starting, you know, you talk, Tony talked about making decisions based on censuses, you know, Adam piggybacked on that. And then, you know, these are two guys who buy graded books and what CBCS didn't want to do is give you a negative interpretation of the market by say, maybe not having graded a lot of a book that there is actually a ton out there. They just haven't gotten to grading them or having graded a lot of a book. That's really actually kind of rare, but based on the sample size, it may lead you to believe that it's less rare. Two types of people are being affected right now. One less than the other. The one the area that's less is those who say are heavily invested in graded books that are prevalent. Say your New Mutants 98, your um, ASM 129, or your ASM more like 361, 300. You're seeing the glutton of books that CBCS has graded and you're realizing, wow, this problem was even bigger than I realized. But I honestly don't think that's going to have a huge effect. I mean, deep in our hearts, we all kind of knew that, right? We go to conventions. We see the amount of ASM 300s that are CBCS labeled. I think any of us with some common sense kind of knew that was going to happen. What I think is surprising some people is some of these like uber rare variants where, where you guys mentioned like the census being so important to what CGC does some of these collectors who maybe had this like J Scott Campbell variant that there's only three of in a nine, eight in the CGC census suddenly now realize I just went from three to six because there's three CBCS nine, eights that majorly affects that market could have uh, a substantial effect on, on big high end um, variants if they are more prevalent than thought of. And what, again, we're talking, this is a matter of sample size. So the smaller the sample size, say six or five, the more an impact on any one given addition to that sample size, you know, that you get. So that's what you're seeing here with that early on from the, the census, but they did a great job. And then if you guys spend some time, I know you guys said you, you spend some time with the CGC census, spend some time with the CBCS set census it is far more comprehensive you can look at graders notes you can look at real specifics on the books incredible i mean if and that's another thing is if you're gonna delay releasing something that the public is clamoring for ooh, when you release it you better you better bring it and they did and they brought it and not only that they dropped it kind of out of nowhere there wasn't like some announcement the census is coming it just came out of nowhere um it it and it was smart to do it that way because we're in a down news cycle and now everybody's talking about CBCS. For the last week, CBCS has been a topic of conversation. And I agree with Adam on the value of competition, but that's what they need. They need to be talked about. They need the attention of the market. They need more people to give them a try, get books graded. They need to grade more key books because that, that, those key books that get graded, they get entombed forever. And that is a walking piece of advertising for your company. So the more that they can do those things, um, the better they're going to be. I think there's some areas they need to work on. Like Brian and I have talked about the, the verification signature is the best thing in all of grading. Uh, it allows you to get a book graded from, say, a deceased creator or a creator that you maybe you didn't have a witness at the time, but, you know, you, you're, you're sitting there like in Step Brothers. You're not going to not get Randy Jackson to sign this sword. So if I'm going to get that signature when I got that opportunity – and I've got this beautiful Donnie Kate signature that's almost worthless on this book. At least now I can get it certified. Um, and I don't feel like they market that enough because that is a competitive advantage for them that they have over the rest. They're affiliated and owned by Beckett Media. Beckett Media is the name in sports cards. It is the, the basically the overstreet, but in a way more important level uh, than overstreet is in comics. Um, they are the kind of the godfathers of, of sports card media. And I think that that lends some credibility to what is going on with CBCS. So shout out to CBCS for doing this. And again, it's kind of like the boom thing where it's like, this stuff is just good for the hobby. So it's good. And I'm glad for all of the, I'm not a huge hardcore grader. Um, I'm not a huge graded collector, but I know this is just really good news for my, my people who are heavily invested in the grading market. Cause now you can kind of see before everyone else figures out, you got this window of opportunity to see like, am I moving in the right direction or uh Oh, do I notice some trends in the CBCS census that tells me I want to switch up my investments? 
Yeah, well, and, and then to, to speak of, uh, of Steve as well, I've listened to a few of uh, interviews he's done recently and, and the things he's put, put it out. Um, he's actively commented on multiple of my posts where I've tagged him in and uh, put him in stories and different stuff. He's extremely active. He's extremely dedicated uh, to the craft. He's all, like you said, there's a lot of things that he, he does that a lot of people in the community don't know why they're doing unless you sit down and listen to an hour, hour and a half interview, unless you talk to him person. He'll answer your Instagram comments. He'll answer your Instagram messages. He's there at CBCS six, seven days a week. His hands go almost on every um, comic that comes through to, to finalize things from what I understand. I mean, he's, he's very dedicated to giving the, the highest level of, of product consistency um, and just turning things over and he's just he has a love for the the um, the, the hobby and, and and a lot of people don't know too is like he was one of the people who helped to start CGC and give them such a great um, uh, great start off and and give them their reputation as being the number one in grading being consistent being fair setting that standard helped to set up the guidelines for how how grading is done um, and now he's started his own company. And the only reason I really even feel like they're, I guess, behind on things is because CGC has been around longer than CBCS. But as time goes on, as, as CBCS is around for longer and longer, you're going to see them do stuff like this. Like, oh, you want a census? Well, here's all the greater notes to everything on that census. They're going to go above and beyond their competition, even if that means delaying things for a little bit, because they're, they're concerned with the long-term goals. They're concerned with you as the hobbyist, as the collector, and they're going to give you from everything I've seen so far and everything I've seen out of that man, the best product that they can possibly give you that they think is going to be the best for you and the best for the community. So def I'm, I'm actually getting ready to send a bunch of books to, uh, to them. Um, a while ago on my Instagram, I had talked about, I was getting ready to send a bunch of books to them. I was going to switch over to CBCS and give them a shot. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. So. I think what you said about greater notes though, Jack, no one, nobody should be charging for greater notes. And that's just, it's like, paying $10,000 to go to college and then you ask your professor why you got a C and they ask for money. Like, that's just stupid. So it, I, that should be a given. I, I definitely think, you know, and something you guys, as you guys were talking, I was just thinking like, I didn't realize I guess that the decision to not have a census was a strategic one previously. Um, and I, I know, uh, like you said, his reasoning for that or what they talked about. I wonder if part of it, though, is, is really just the comparison. Now that we have a census, if you look at high volume books, you're going to have an actual metric to measure. You, you can look at spawn number one and somebody can break it down. What is the average grade for spawn books on CGC? What is the average grade for spawn one? on CBCS, um, it's always been talked about, oh, this company grades better than this company, or oh, no, this company grades horribly. Every, you know, it's kind of all over the board. Everybody's got their favorite. Um, but now there's going to be, there's actually a way to measure that. So I wonder if there's going to be some aggregating of, of, those, uh, of those two, you know, data sets of data points. Um, not that that will be accurate. You know, I think statistically speaking, uh, you could you could come up with a good argument, but like you said, sample size is, is huge. But I don't think that's going to stop people from starting to compare now that they're both uh, they're both available. Yeah, well, I'll tell you the the reason why you're paying for greater notes at CGC is because for a long time they were top dog with no competition, so they thought, how can we make a little bit of extra money? I'm gonna right. charge for something that should have been included in that price point to begin with. So I guarantee you, you're going to either micro transactions like video games. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're just shaving that one tenth of a cent out of there. Um, oh, you wanted bubble wrap. Oh, okay. No, you yeah. want a protection. Oh, okay. And, you didn't pay extra. Sorry. Exactly. So what, what I guarantee what you're going to see is you're going to CGC is going to have to adapt. Uh, and, and now that's going to help us. I mean, even with something as silly, uh, something I love that CGC is doing is those custom labels. I think they're cool, uh, the Spider-Man, all that stuff. But I guarantee you if CBCS started to offer those for $4 a piece on their labels, CGC would have to go down to $3, and then they could go to 2 one, and then, you know what? Years in the future, custom labels could be just a free option that you they upload offer. your own image as a label. No, exactly. There you go. Yeah, you could have a picture of Brian on your, you know, Amazing Fantasy fifteen nine eight that you're going to get graded. So yeah, you you joke. I want to do an exclusive variant and then get a custom label for the graded nine eight option. I want that <laughs> Simpleman's Comics CBCS exclusive label. Rooster River label. 
I'm putting that out there. I'm putting yeah. that out there into the universe. Into right the now. universe. Yeah. I want that custom CBCS Simple Men's Comics label. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, especially with how much uh, people can move stuff in the community nowadays with these big, you know, bigger YouTube channels and stuff like that. I mean, shoot, if I could get some sort of crazy boom blank variant and send it to Brian to draw a picture on and then send it into CBCS <laughs> and get a, 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 you know, a Simple Men's Comic custom label on it. Uh, that'd be great. You know, I'd have them draw a picture of your face on their deck, you know, and we'll just <laughs> be center of my display when I finally get that up. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I personally, I like the census. I was, I'll admit I was one of the impatient ones that was like waiting for it, kept waiting for it to come out. There's no stranger that we've talked about CBCS on this before that I'm a fan of CBCS. Um, I'd be lying if I said I didn't own CGC c c comics as well but i've always liked C cbcs i'm still not a big fan of the rivets cover but that's another story i think they grade well i think they have great competition and i agree steve brock's a great person and like you said he's a comic fan first who has a grading company which is i think bodes well to the comic community whether people know that or not i mean great guy and he's a big supporter of that hero initiative hero initiative is a great thing uh comic core friends of our channel they're also part of Hero Initiative stuff. So we love promoting that. And I was able to have the opportunity to facilitate a panel last week with Steve Barak and, and some other people for that Hero Initiative. And that was a great opportunity as well. He also, before CGC was founded, he was a grader for stuff at auction at like Sotheby, Sotheby's and Christie's. I mean, he's been around for a good while. So the fact that he's also big in the comic community makes me a big fan. Nicest guy, like you guys said. Um, he was just recently, friend, another friend that was also on this this podcast, Nico, he just did an interview with him over on that Tales from a Flipside channel if you want to check them out. But even more importantly, they got a new label, they got a new holder coming out, they're going to have a registry, but they're not calling a registry. And if you want to ask questions about any of that, we are also going to have Steve Barak right here on this podcast on the next episode. So stay tuned nice. for that. So with that being said, before we go, we want to let our panelists know where you can find them on social media and what they got going on as well. Tony, we'll start with you. Uh, I am not the talented content creator that these guys are, but I am on, on, uh, on Instagram at blue green artifacts, I'm pretty active on eBay. I got about a thousand listings. Check it out. Maybe there's something that would, that would interest you. Is that blue green artifacts as well? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I guess I would take this time to to let uh, any other viewers know that um, this community at, at Simple Man's Comics is has been a big value, uh, just entertainment wise and and interest wise. Getting to chat on the Discord and 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 get the opinions and uh, of of people like me. Uh, but also uh, on the spec side of things. So if you if you aren't subscribed to the Bolo Box uh, and, and joined in on the Patreon, uh, I would I would strongly recommend it. Oh, I definitely thank you, and we also thank both y'all for your support. Not only do we we always talk about community on the channel, so we always view this as one big community, and we might not have physically have met, but we all consider each other great friends, which I think is one of the great added benefits of getting to know everyone through the Patreon. But also, Adam, what do you got going on? Uh, so you guys can find me at Strange Tales to Collect on Instagram and on YouTube as well. I'm a lot more active on my Instagram channel or Instagram page, I should say, than my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, videos come out very irregularly for me on that, but sometimes, you know, once a month, once every few weeks, whatever it is, uh, you can catch That's one of my videos. That's called life of a pop pop that, or dad dad. Yeah, yeah, two kids, uh, full time job, and a lot of uh, a lot of hobbies that I like to get into: archery, shooting, a bunch of different things like that. So I I, uh, I make videos when I can, um, but like I said, strange tales collect on Instagram. I post pretty regularly on there, and I and I I sell on there as well, but I also. Um, do kind of like a 50 50 split where i try to give some advice i talk about some comics i'm looking at i'm talking about how you can take advantage of uh you know spec cycle this that and the other cold hot books and all those different things um and then i'm pretty uh i try to stay as active as i can on the uh the discord as well uh, that's a great thing about the the patreon group is that i've enjoyed the most is the discord chat so you have access to brian all the time jack all the time um, i'm on there a bunch of great guys are on there um, as far as like getting ahead of the game you'll definitely hear a lot of spec going on. And it's not just like 
whatever spec. It's like, this is well thought out. People take the time. If they post it in there, they believe in it. And a lot of times it's turned out really, really well. So um, it's, it's really, really uh, great. And so I just want to say thanks guys for, uh, for having me here. Um, I appreciate it. I always get, love getting to hang out with y'all. Um, and I'm the same kind of way. I view this as a community. I view this as like a, like a family. Y'all are my, you know, great friends to me. And, and on my page, on my channel, whatever I'm doing, guys, I'm, I'm not doing it to promote something. I'm literally doing it because that's like, this is what I'm putting my money into. I believe in it. And I'm just trying to help you get ahead of the game the best I can. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but either that's way, it's just a good time. Man. Yeah, exactly. So don't try to sue me if you lose money on a book because I have like $7 in my bank account anyways. So you're not going to get you know, anything in the way that my check-ins and savings is set up is it's not going to come out right away. Um, so, <laughs> you're okay but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, but no guys, um, love to chat, love to hang out, love to talk. So I'm just really appreciative of getting to be here guys. And I'm, I'm really glad. And like you, like y'all said, I, I consider y'all great friends and, and I love getting to talk to y'all and get to talk to the community. So thanks for having me. Well, guys, I really appreciate the kind words. Um, you know, we tried to create the the community, but the reality is it's all of you within the community who make up the kind of dynamic that we've been able to foster. So thank you to you and everybody out there in the Simplements Comics family um, who participates, whether it's via our Patreon or even just in the live chats or oh, gets active, throws a comment on a video, shares a video on Facebook or Instagram. We truly appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you guys for coming on and, and giving us your unique perspectives on the comics industry. It was a great discussion. I hope everybody out there watching the video and listening to us on whatever audio platform you're listening to got some good nuggets of information, something you can run with, something you're excited to go and uh, get to researching. So thank you, guys. Uh, that, was a, that was a great episode. Yeah, I'll also say that the links to both of Tony and Adam's social media and everything they mentioned, eBay, we'll put that in the description of this video, as well as a card up there right now for Adam's YouTube channel if you guys want to check that out. I want to thank you guys as well. And remember, Steve Barak is going to be on the next episode of Simple Man's Comics and Friends. We'll see you then. Tell them this is Brian and Jack, Tony and Adam with Simple Man's Comics and Friends.